In the previous chapters we have learned how to identify a specific gene and how to clone uh, a specific gene for a specific phenotype, for example. In this chapter we will study the gene itself, that is, its expression and its function. We will see some techniques uh, dealing with how to study the RNA transcript of the gene and the regulation of expression of the gene and how to study the gene itself or the translation product of the gene itself. When we have identified our gene of interest, we typically want to study this process here, how the gene is turned into an mRNA and the details around this and how this mRNA is translated into a protein. As you already know, some genes contain introns, particularly genes from eukaryotic sources. It would be interesting to know how many, where uh, these introns are and uh, how they are processed. In some cases, these exons are processed in different ways to create different versions of the gene. This is a very interesting uh, process to study. Uh, in more detail, it's interesting to know exactly where the transcription starts and where it ends. That is, how long is this 5' prime untranslated and 3' prime untranslated region. It's often confused with the start and the end of the open reading frame, the start codon is here, but the mRNA is always a little bit longer than the, the, the actual coding sequence of the gene. One of the most fundamental techniques to study RNA or mRNA is the northern hybridization. This is a technique that is almost uh, identical to the southern hybridization that we learned about in chapter 8. Uh, the only real difference here is that we separate RNA on a gel instead of DNA and then we transfer this RNA to a membrane and then we probe this membrane with a radioactive probe uh, that can be DNA uh, or RNA or any nucleic acid or an oligonucleotide and then we develop this uh, this membrane and see the signal. We can match the signal with the bands on this gel, just like for southern blot. Usually when we separate total RNA on a gel, we see two big bands here. These are ribosomal RNA bands because these are the most abundant RNA molecules in the cell. mRNA is just a small fraction of the total RNA. <clears throat> this technique can tell us, for instance, where uh, a certain gene is expressed. If we have, for example, three tissues here uh, from, from a patient, for instance, or from a human being. We can see that our gene is only expressed in, in tissue one. Another thing we can see is the size. We can see the size of this signal here compared to the gel. That means that typically we have a DNA probe and uh, the size of the, uh, the mRNA can be compared to the size of the gene if we know it. And then we can know roughly if there are any untranslated regions or introns in the sequence because then the mRNA will appear larger than we expect on the gel. In order to um, uh, estimate the location and, uh, and size of introns and exons in a gene, we can use a technique called S1 nuclease mapping. S1 nuclease, as you remember from chapter 4 perhaps, is a nuclease that cuts single-stranded DNA preferably. Um, what we do is we simply hybridize a portion of the genomic DNA to the mRNA of a gene that we are interested in. And then uh, what will happen is that some por 
some portions of the gene corresponding to the exons will hybridize, but the portions corresponding to the introns will not because these are removed in the post-transcriptional modification. Um, what we do is then treat this hybrid with S1 nuclease, which will completely degrade these loops uh, corresponding to the, to the introns. And then we can remove the RNA and analyze these fragments by gel electrophoresis. And we get an idea of how many introns there are. And by comparing, by summing the size here, we can get an idea of um, the total size of the introns as well. It's however not possible to deduce the positions of the of the introns. This only gets you a, a rough estimation because the order is not preserved um, in the gel electrophoresis. The S1 nuclease mapping technique can be modified in order to find the start point of transcription for a gene. Uh, it's a quite small modification. What we do is we clone uh, part of the beginning of the gene, including a little bit of the uh, coding sequence of the gene and a little bit of the sequence before the gene. In this example, this uh, molecule is cloned into M13. Um, as you remember from the previous chapter, the M13 phage produces single-stranded DNA, and that's important uh, in this case. This DNA has to be radioactive as well, so we have to somehow grow these phages so that they produce radioactive DNA. We then mix this DNA with uh, mRNA from uh, some source, maybe a tissue or something else, and some part of this mRNA will hybridize to the single-stranded DNA. We then degrade all single-stranded DNA and RNA with S1 nuclease, just like in the previous slide, and we end up with this uh, double-stranded DNA-RNA hybrid. We remove the RNA and then we analyze this DNA by electrophoresis. And the size, the length of this fragment will tell us the distance between this restriction site here and the initial, the, the starting point for the, the transcription. This is a real world example of um, <clears throat> S1 nuclease mapping to find the transcription start point. These uh, authors here used this technique to find uh, the starting point for a rice gene. Uh, and what they did was uh, the, the double-stranded uh, fragment, or the, the final fragment, they ran it um, in parallel with a sequencing gel so that they could exactly pinpoint on the nucleotide uh, where the starting point is. This is a, a very precise technique and it allows you to identify the exact point where the transcription starts. Often we know a little bit about the sequence of our uh, gene of interest and if we do, uh, if we especially know a little bit of the sequence in the beginning of the, of the gene, we can use an alternative technique to find the start of the transcription. This technique is called primer extension and it's, uh, it's a little bit faster than the previous S1 nuclease mapping because we don't need to clone any gene in this case. We simply use the sequence information in the beginning of the gene to design an oligonucleotide, a PCR primer, uh, in a way. And uh, this primer, this oligonucleotide, has to be radioactively labeled and it has to point outwards from the gene. So the 5' prime here is in this, uh, in this direction. And then we use reverse transcriptase that makes a copy 
DNA copy of the RNA molecule until the end. So um, we have this DNA copy that actually corresponds to the uh, all the way to the beginning of the transcription. Uh, then we analyze this molecule just like in the previous uh, example and the size between this the location of this primer here and will tell us exactly where the transcription starts. Um, of course the limitation here is that we have to know a little bit about this sequence in order to design this primer and we can only use it in this end. We can only use it for five prime finding out where transcription starts. We cannot use it for finding out where the transcription stops because we need to we have no um, reverse transcriptase that can go the other way around. It always goes five prime to three prime. Uh, this is a real-life example of finding the transcription start point by primer extension. And this particular example is a gene of uh, Bacillus subtilis called SIGY. And it's a quite neat example. Uh, we can see here that they did almost the same thing. They uh, separated uh, the final product of the extension. Uh, on a DNA sequencing gel, and this gel here has one lane for each uh, nucleotide because there were, they are radioactively labeled, so you need to do four different sequencing reactions in parallel. And you can, by following the sequencing patterns, you can tell exactly where this uh, molecule ends up, where it starts, because this gel has a very high resolution. If we look uh, up the sequence, uh, the genomic sequence, and the primer that the authors used. Uh, we can see that the DNA <coughs> molecules are quite small here. Um, the RNA transcriptase would start here and translate all the way to this point. So it's on maybe 20, 30 nucleotides. It's important that this part is quite short because RNA um, re or reverse transcriptase is not a very efficient enzyme and it might fall off if this, uh, this distance is too large. But if we keep it very short, like in this example, it should be no problem. It, RNA or reverse transcriptase should be able to go all the way to this point here. Uh, one of the problems with the, both the S1 nuclease mapping and uh, the primer extension is that the total amount of DNA is very small, the total amount of DNA that you analyze in the end. And uh, that's uh, the reason why you actually have to have radioactively labeled DNA, uh, because otherwise it would be too little to detect in the gel. There is another alternative technique that is perhaps more used nowadays called RACE, Rapid Amplification of cDNA Ends. And uh, here you use a technique that is similar to the primer extension, but you have a forward primer as well. So you can actually perform a PCR and that means that you will have much more DNA in the end. If we look at the steps involved, uh, we anneal a primer. This is exactly the same as in the previous slide. We extend the DNA, but then we use a terminal transferase. That is a, an enzyme that can add nucleotides to the three prime end of DNA. If you see DNA polymerases normally needs a, temp a primer or some, some priming at least, either DNA or RNA, in order to be able to add nucleotides. But terminal transferase doesn't need that. It can add nucleotides here without any problems. And uh, if we do that, we add 
for instance, G's or C's at the end of this cDNA. We can then design a primer that is complementary to this sequence and we can amplify uh, with PCR the, the, the piece of DNA that we would normally analyze on a gel. And this, uh, since it's PCR, we, we can obtain a very high amount of this DNA fragment, which we can then simply sequence. Another advantage of Another advantage of race is that you can adapt it to find where the transcription ends, the transcription endpoint, uh, at least for eukaryotic uh, transcripts, transcripts or mRNAs. What you do here is that you start with a poly T primer here, and uh, since eukaryotic mRNA has a poly A tail, this poly T primer would bind easily here. Then you use reverse transcriptase in the same manner and you uh, make a copy, a DNA copy, a cDNA of the RNA. We degrade the RNA and then we add a gene specific primer. This is something we need to know. We need to know something about the sequence of the, of the gene in order to design this primer. And we make a PCR with this primer and a primer maybe specific to this uh, part, this last part of the, um, of the first oligonucleotide. And doing this we can perhaps with a nested primer, one primer that sits more to the right here in this image, we can obtain a good amount of this PCR product that's very specific and that we can sequence. And when we do, we will know exactly where the transcription ends, which is exactly here, just left of the poly A tail. Then we might ask, couldn't we use this uh, selection of technologies to clone entire genes from mRNA molecules? And we can, we can do that. Um, we could, in theory, add a poly T primer and then extend it all the way to to the five prime end. And we could possibly add a, a forward primer here. Uh, the only problem here is that our uh, reverse transcriptase is not very efficient. It has a difficult time to uh, synthesize long genes like this, and many of the actual DNA copies are not complete. They end here for a reason or another. So it's, it's a technically difficult problem to synthesize cDNA all the way to the original five prime end of the, of the transcript. There are, um, uh, however, uh, techniques where you have tried to adapt the technology in order to clone entire genes from, uh, from mRNA. And these protocols start exactly like the three prime rays. You have a poly T primer here, you adapt or you anneal this. This is the reverse transcriptase that synthesizes a copy, a DNA copy of the mRNA. And uh, when it reaches the five prime end of the, the mRNA, this um, reverse transcriptase has a tendency to add a few cytosines here in, uh, at the end. So this is the same kind of activity that reverse um, or the um, terminal transferase had. At the same time, the timing here is a little bit. If you add a oligonucleotide that has three G's here, or four in this case, in, uh, in the three prime end. What happens is that the reverse transcriptase, we can, we can trick the reverse transcriptase to continue to synthesize the cDNA. So this molecule here anneals to, 
to the strand, to the cDNA strand that's being uh, that's being uh, synthesized, and then reverse transcriptase uses this oligonucleotide as a template. So it's important to here to understand that this primer here is not priming any DNA synthesis here. It's just annealing, so locating here, and it's used as a copy in order to. And what what is um, what is incorporated in the cDNA is the complementary sequence of the oligo. And when you have done that, you can use uh, specific sequences that you incorporate in both the reverse, these blue areas here, to make a second PCR where you can obtain specifically all those transcripts, even though they are a few, few transcripts um, are complete in this reaction. You can amplify those by PCR using these uh, specific primers. Um, one modification that is common here nowadays is that instead of these last nucleotides here being DNA, they are actually RNA. So you have RNA basis instead of DNA basis. So this molecule is actually a RNA DNA hybrid. So this last part here is DNA, whereas this front part here is RNA. And this modification is done because apparently there's less tendency for this oligonucleotide to bind unspecifically in other places. Um, this is a very short sequence and it could bind in other places on the on the uh, growing cDNA here, but this modification apparently makes it more specific for this location where there is actually a, a, a cap on the mRNA as well. The previous uh, techniques that we discussed uh, makes it possible to know where the transcript starts. Uh, we might also want to know how the gene, how the process of transcription is actually regulated. And uh, the gene is often, of course, turned on and off by sequences located in the promoter or in the control sequences upstream. Um, these sequences are relatively short, maybe only around 10 base pairs, and they usually bind transcription factor. And the combination of these transcription factors is that makes up the regulatory circuit for a gene. And it's perhaps as important to study the regulation of a gene as the gene itself. Uh, we can use a technique called gel retardation assay in order to find roughly which ones and where uh, transcriptional factors or DNA binding proteins bind. Uh, we can, this example here is um, for a promoter for a gene, but in principle any DNA can be used. And here we select a restriction site first, a restriction enzyme that gives us a few well-defined uh, fragments of the promoter here. And um, we isolate these DNA fragments and then we mix uh, some of our mixture with a transcription factor or a DNA binding protein. We can use several in this mixture, but it should probably not be too many. And they need to be present at a relatively high concentration. So you probably need to produce this protein and purify it. And when you um, simply, then, then to analyze this is simply by loading a mixture without and a mixture with the transcription factor on a gel and then observe which one of these fragments is re retarded. That is, it doesn't travel so fast as the others. And you can roughly point out that, for instance, this transcription factor binds this fragment. It's not very precise, but on the other hand, it's easy to analyze uh, quite a large distance here. 
you might not know where <clears throat> exactly this factor binds and using this technique you can at least uh, pinpoint the place to here at least so you can continue to study this region of the promoter instead of all of it. Then again the gel retardation assay doesn't tell you exactly where your regulatory protein bind but uh, you can easily find out by uh, mixing your protein with your DNA. It could be a fragment that you identify <clears throat> with a gel retardation assay. And then you mix uh, in your uh, DNAs1. DNAs1 is a very unspecific um, nucleus. It will digest all of the DNA that it can bind, really. But some of the DNA will be protected by the protein. There's simply not room for the DNAs to, to actually attack the DNA inside here. And by analyzing this, these nucleotides inside, it could be a very short uh, stretch of DNA, maybe only a few base pairs, 10, 10, 20 base pairs or so. You can more or less deduce where exactly this uh, this protein binds. Now, how is the footprinting assay performed in practice? Since the DNA molecules are very short, maybe only 10, 20 base pairs, they're very difficult to study by themselves. So in order to actually uh, understand where this regulatory or which DNA that is protected by the regulatory protein, um, we use longer DNA molecules that have an end label and a very limited digestion of DNAs one. So the way this works is that we start with our DNA molecules, we label them in the five prime end, and then we mix in our protein here. The protein will bind to all of, all of the molecules. And then we add a very, very, very small amount of DNAs1. The DNAs1 concentration or the amount or the activity is so low that in general, in a, on average, each molecule will only be cut once. And this means that these molecules will be cut everywhere except where the DNA is protected by the transcription factor. And if we uh, separate uh, the DNA fragments. Uh, if we do this experiment without the transcription factor, we will get all of the sizes possible. These molecules here typically differ by only one nucleotide because on average they cut on every possible position and if we separate them we get them in size order like this. If we then analyze our sample with the protein, we will find that there is one size window where we don't get any fragments. This is precisely where this transcription factor binds and we call this hole in the gel the footprint and we can deduce exactly which the nucleotides are because these molecules differ by only one nucleotide here. So we can say that by analyzing these ones exactly where it binds or exactly which nucleotides are protected by the transcription factor at least. Now of course a protein bound to DNA can protect a large region or a significant region of DNA but that doesn't necessarily tell us which ones of these nucleotides actually bind to the protein which, which ones of these nucleotides inside here are important for the binding of the protein. This is not necessarily the same thing. Here in this example we have all these nucleotides protected, but the actual control sequence is maybe only these nucleotides here, and this means that this binding protein can bind DNA where perhaps these, where these nucleotides are different here, and only these ones here in the middle are important. And how do we then 
find out how to do this. We can, of course, do it with a, another complication of this very same idea. In order to find exactly which nucleotides are important for binding of a transcription factor, we can use a modification interference assay. In this example here, we add methyl groups to guanine nucleotides using dimethyl sulfate. So if we add this compound to our DNA, we will attach an extra methyl group to, to the guanine nucleotides. There are other examples of these modifications, but um, we only consider this for simplicity. And when we have added a methyl group, we assume that our transcription factor no longer binds. If we add a methyl group to one of the nucleotides that is important for binding, then it will no longer bind. So the rest of the protocol is quite similar to the previous one. Uh, we have our end labeled DNA here, and then we modify the DNA using dimethyl sulfate, and we use very, very little. So in, on average, we add one methyl group per molecule, no more. And then we add our transcription factor, exactly like before, and we can see that we have some molecules where the methyl group prevents binding of the transcription factor. And then we simply um, separate the DNA, just like before, one without and one with. And then we will see the opposite here, which bands are not retarded on the gel, which, which bands are um, not affected. That means that it's not binding and the modification prevents the binding. We isolate this DNA and we purify it. And then we um, treat it with a chemical called piperidine. This molecule, it's related to the molecule in pepper, in black pepper. And this molecule has a specific um, activity or a specific reaction that it catalyzes that will um, cut the DNA at this modification. So we can compare this uncut molecule with the one that is cut by paperidine to know exactly where this methyl group was uh, situated. Here in more detail, if we have a methyl group in the area where binding is important, we won't get any binding. And um, we can analyze then this band and this band and this band will not be uh, delayed or retarded on the gel, whereas this will. And by analyzing enough of these molecules that don't bind the transcription factor, we can know exactly which ones are of these nucleotides are important. Of course, knowing exactly which ones of the transcription factors bind upstream a gene won't actually tell us how this works or how the gene is regulated inside the cell. It will only tell us that some transcription factor might bind in some places. It doesn't really tell us how the gene is regulated. Uh, one powerful method to, to actually study the protein, or no, study the, the promoter rather than the gene, is to replace the gene with a, a reporter gene. That is a, re, a gene whose expression is much easier to study than the original one. We can, for instance, uh, use any of these genes here that either catalyze a chemical reaction that's easy to spot or encode a fluorescent protein like GFP. In this example here, we put a reporter gene in place of our gene and we delete some control sequence and then we see that 
the gene expression is changed, you know, from only being in a, in a seed, for instance, if this is a plant, and this is a seed-specific control sequence, we can see that the gene is now expressed in all tissues. This tells us something about the gene itself, that it's only expressed in in a seed, for instance, in this case, that can tell us a lot about the function of the gene. GFP uh, is a very nice example of a reporter gene. It's used in this context, but also to localize um, localize uh, proteins inside cells. Since GFP is fluorescent by itself, it doesn't need just to add any substrates or anything. We can just shine um, light on the cell and look at the fluorescence. We see here yeast cells, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that have a GFP tagged protein that is located in the membrane, in this case, in the nucleus, probably, in this case, and in the nuclear membrane here, and here, maybe, in the cytosol. <coughs> We often have a sample of the pure protein expressed from a gene even before we have the gene cloned. In the case we have not, uh, we might want to study the protein, the expressed um, protein in more detail before we actually clone the gene. We can do two things to solve this. We can either express the gene in some kind of protein production host but there is no guarantee that this will be working very well or that this will be efficient it's also very time consuming alternatively we can use cell-free translation and this uh, technique is quicker we don't need to actually clone anything uh, we simply mix a cell extract that has all the contents of a cell except RNA and then we have mixed this with pure mRNA and the ribosomes in the cell-free translation system will produce a radioactive labeled protein because we mix also in a um, radioactive amino acid. And then we can separate the produced proteins on a gel and we can, for instance, blot these proteins over to um, a membrane and uh, screen antibodies or something like that or we can probably isolate uh, the protein and study it further the quantities are quite small that are produced that's why we have to have a radioactive label here otherwise we wouldn't be able to see these uh, proteins being produced uh, why would you do this sometimes we don't actually know which kind of protein is produced by a certain mRNA. Maybe there are alternative uh, start codons, alternative stop codons. Maybe there's some kind of post-transcriptional modification that we don't know about. And uh, th all, this, all these things we can study in this way. The book describes uh, two protocols for in vitro translation. One is called hybrid arrest translation and the other is called hybrid release translation. Both of these uh, methods require us to have a cDNA of the protein that we or, or the gene we want to study. Hybrid arrest translation is uh, starts with a population of mRNA and then we take a part of this population or a sample of this population and we mix this with a um, cDNA. This means that that cDNA that is on this clone here will hybridize to one specific mRNA or a few specific mRNAs. And then in the subsequent cell-free translation this double-stranded structure will not lead to protein production. So if we separate uh, the proteins from not adding the without the cDNA or no sorry without the cDNA and with the cDNA we will see that when we add this clone here the cDNA clone 
one of the proteins or a few of the proteins will not be produced. And we can deduce that it's this band here that corresponds to the, the, um, the cDNA that we added. The hybrid release translation is slightly different. The first step here is that we attach cDNA on a piece of paper or, or a membrane. And then we use this membrane to fish out specific mRNA, so they will hybridize here on this surface. This could be a very small piece of paper, for instance. Then we elute this mRNA, the hybridized mRNA. So this is a specific, we wash away the mRNA that is not specific for the cDNA that we attached on the paper. And then we simply do the same, we do the cell translation and here we will ideally get only one or a few products. So the book doesn't really go into details what is the real advantage and disadvantage of each of these techniques, but one advantage of hybrid release translation might be that we can study genes that are very much less expressed. We have this membrane and we can use this to fish out much more mRNA uh, by, for instance, yeah, it's easy. We can use several papers or, or we, can, we can make sure that we have enough of this uh, mRNA here. Whereas this technique, we only have whatever mRNA is that were in the original sample and it might be difficult to study mRNAs that are very rare in this sample. On the contrary, this is a nice internal control of the method. We should get all these products when the experiment has gone correctly. Whereas here we only get one band and if we get nothing here it's difficult to tell what went wrong maybe. Whereas here you see the result as a specific missing band here and you see all the other translation products. We have our gene cloned and also the protein studied. We might want to uh, elucidate more in more detail how the protein actually works. If it's an enzyme for instance we might want to study what are the actual amino acids in the active site or which amino acids are important for stability of the protein. And we might go about that uh, comparing the original protein. We somehow produce enough amount of the pure protein to compare with one where we made very specific changes. So we typically make a specific change in the DNA sequence or the RNA sequence which translates to a very specific change in the amino acid sequence. And then we study this, these, uh, the difference between these proteins. One of the simplest way to, uh, ways to, to change our DNA sequence, our coding sequence for our gene is to digest with restriction enzymes. There are many now on sale and usually we can find at least some of these enzymes will cut our sequence. Um, one way to, do, to use these enzymes is to identify an enzyme that cuts twice in our sequence so that we can remove the part that is be, uh, between these restriction sites. For instance, the normal protein versus one where we digest and remove this middle part here. This usually uh, result in a protein with a big deletion because we don't control exactly where these uh, enzymes cut. We have to use the cut sites that are already there. Are already there. Uh, we can also make a smaller modification by simply cutting with an enzyme that has produces sticky ends or cohesive ends. And then we use a nuclease that will cut away nucleotides from the edges of the DNA. And then we use ligase to 
cut it to to um, to close the DNA again, and this will be a typically a smaller deletion. It uh, depends on what kind of nuclease we use here, but we can, for instance, use one that only cuts away the the sticky ends of the enzyme. Then we get a deletion of perhaps four nucleotides. Again, the disadvantage here is that we have to do this whenever we on the site of this restriction enzyme. We we don't actually control where this is, and it might not be in the place that's interesting. Uh, finally, we can add an oligonucleotide. We can insert a little piece of DNA in the gene by simply opening up. This is just normal cloning. We just use a very small insert here, and we could study a protein that has a small insertion here. And um, again, we don't decide exactly where this can be done because of the specificity of the enzyme. There are site-specific mutation techniques we can use to virtually change any nucleotide in our target sequence. Uh, in this example here, we have a sequence of our normal gene and we want to change this aspergine here, this amino acid, to a tyrosine. And uh, we have to, of course, know quite a bit. We have to know some of the sequence of our gene, uh, at least. And what we do is we switch the fewest nucleotides necessary in order to switch the codon of this, of this protein here. So from AAT to ATA, so that's um, two nucleotides are different. And then we select sequence uh, on either either side of the of the site of the mutation. And uh, this is typically maybe 15 to 20 nucleotides on each side. Here we only cho show uh, two or six nucleotides for clarity. And when we design an oligonucleotide that has the new sequence, most of it is the same, but it has this change in the middle. And because most of the sequence is the same, it can actually anneal with, uh, with the original sequence. Of course, this olig oligonucleotide is, is made um, complementary to the original sequence, but it will code a different amino acid. Then we mix our original clone. In this case, we have an, it cloned in an M13 vector, so this DNA here is uh, single-stranded. We add our oligonucleotide, and then we add DNA polymerase, and it will sorry, synthesize the whole complementary strand. This will, of course, not be uh, uh, completely closed because the DNA polymerase will synthesize until here and leave a, a, a space here or, or it will not close. We don't typically add DNA ligase in this experiment. Because it isn't necessary, we, we then uh, transform E. coli with this round molecule and um, the E. coli will start producing M13 phages. Half of those phages will be from this original strand, and the other half will be from the green strand. Uh, we might want, wonder how is it that this green strand that is actually linear will direct phage uh, production. And uh, the answer is that this uh, gap in the sequence of the green strand will be um, repaired in vivo before uh, replication of the of the green the mutated phage and then we can uh, streak these phages on a lawn of bacteria and identify for instance by uh, southern blot for instance which ones are uh, mutated because we we need to find our clones here we have 50 50 and Half of these clones will be the original gene that we don't want. The other half will be 
uh, our mutated gene. This works quite well, but it's messy to work with radioactivity in this way. So there are new and improved techniques to do this. A quicker method to introduce specific mutations is uh, overlap extension PCR. Um, this is a very, very quick, very rapid technique. and We can have our mutated sequence in one day if we are lucky. We start, as before, uh, identifying whatever mutation we want here in the middle of the gene. And then we prepare two PCR reactions. We need to know at least the sequence around our site of mutation. We also need to know the sequence in the beginning of the gene and in the end in order to design PCR primers. So we carry out two PCRs. One has the normal forward primer of this sequence and then a reverse primer that covers the, uh, the site of mutation. This oligonucleotide is very similar to the one we saw in the last slide. It has uh, a portion that is uh, annealing to the sequence and then it has a middle place here where the, we introduce a change. We do another PCR where we design the complement of this oligonucleotide and we use this as a forward primer together with the normal reverse primer of the, of the gene sequence. And in the end we will get a PCR product that covers more or less from the beginning of the gene until our change that we want to change. So this, in this case this is about half the gene. And then we have a product that covers from the change until the end. So this is also the half of the gene. And then you purify these two PCR products and mix them together in a new PCR tube. And uh, here you don't need to add any primers or anything. You can see that the top strand here of this product and the lower strand here of this product can anneal together like this. And DNA polymerase is able to fill in the rest of the strands and we will eventually arrive to a PCR product that has our change and the entire sequence. And uh, this population here will be uh, entirely made up of the mutated sequences so um, there is no purification necessary here. So this is a very straightforward technique. The disadvantage here is that this sequence here is the copy of a copy. So we copy first a part of the sequence here, we copy this, this is already a copy, and then we use these two copies to make another copy. So if we have any errors in this DNA synthesis, we have uh, a risk that there are more errors introduced by the PCR process in our final sequence. So we typically need to sequence our final product before we use it to be sure that this change here is the only change that was introduced. The perhaps most popular protocol for cytodirected mutagenesis is called whole plasmid synthesis. Here, this protocol is very similar to the two previous ones, but it does away with some of the disadvantages. Um, we start, one advantage over the other protocols, that, that we start with a plasmid. This can actually be any plasmid, uh, and we have our gene of interest cloned here at some point. We, we, we simply use the whole molecule as a starting material. It's important that this uh, DNA is methylated and the reason for that I will come to in the end. Um, the second step is to design oligonucleotides just like in the previous protocols we have incorporated our change and uh, in the middle and we have two regions of complementary DNA. These two, the, the pink and the blue, 
primers are exactly complementary to each other. And we use them in two different reactions, uh, very similar to PCR, um, but we only add this one primer. The result is that the product of this reaction will be a linear piece of DNA that goes all the way around, incorporates the primer, goes all the way around, and then it stops here, leaving a, a gap in the sequence. So the blue sequence is linear. The same happens here. We make another copy. This is the complementary strand to the blue one. Uh, and in the same way, a gap is left in the, in the sequence, just next to the, where the primer binds. We then mix um, all the DNA present in these two reactions and we have, we can count four different kinds of molecules. The original molecules, the two strands of the original and the two synthesized strands. We mix and heat and we let them combine with each other and we can count four different combinations. Our original molecule um, the original strand with the, just like here, these two, and then by chance this strand and this strand can combine to form an almost circular structure here. We can see that although these two molecules are linear, there is a part here covering the primer that where they actually anneal and it leaves a uh, an opening here and here, but because these openings are not on the same place, we can actually see this as a circular structure. Then we add a, an enzyme, restriction enzyme, called DPN1. And this enzyme has a very peculiar uh, specificity. It actually di digests DNA that is methylated. So the original DNA strand will be cut in small pieces whether uh, while uh, leaving this molecule, the combination of the two copies. We transform with this mixture. Since these strands are degraded, most of the clones will contain this, um, the desired molecule. And we can just screen a few clones normally in order to find our final uh, product. You might ask, doesn't this protocol suffer from the same disadvantage as the PCR, the overlap extension PCR, uh, because we actually make copies here? And the answer to that is no, because every, every blue strand here is a copy of the original strand, and every pink strand is a copy of the original. They don't copy, we don't make copies of copies here because in each reaction we only have one primer. So the, this mixture or the, this, these two molecules are always copies of the original strand. And uh, this is, um, leaves you with both um, advantages. You don't need any radioactive um, procedure in order to to identify the correct clones here either. The DPN1 restriction enzyme has a very short uh, recognition sequence, so GATC will um, occur in many many places along the DNA, but the requirement here is that we have a methylation on the A here on the sequence. So if the plasmid is methylated then this, um, this enzyme will, will completely digest the DNA. I should say that um, the DNA that we use to synthesize plasm uh, to, to, to synthesize DNA, for instance, in the PCR reactions, is never methylated. So DPN1 will not digest our newly synthesized DNA. Creating a completely synthetic gene gives us the most control of the sequence of, of our gene. We can, for instance, uh, change all the codons 
in order to improve expression of a gene. This is a very common reason to make uh, a synthetic gene. We can also make as many specific changes as we want in one go. Um, this is used through combining single-strand pieces of DNA, single-strand DNA oligos here, and then fill in the missing pieces with DNA polymerase, uh, as you would in a PCR process. Um, these synthetic pieces of oligonucleotide, is, uh, they are commercially available at a quite low price nowadays. They are made in vitro by a chemical, cyclic chemical reaction that is quite interesting. Uh, as you know, normal DNA, natural DNA synthesis is 5' prime to 3', prime, while the chemical process is 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Um, if we look a little bit closer on this um, chemical, chemical um, cycle, we see that uh, our starting material is a base, DNA base in this case, linked to a glass bead or something else, a solid matrix. And on the 5' prime end it has a blocking group, in this case a chemical called DMT. This blocking group prevents unwanted chemical reactions on the 5' prime end of our DNA. The first step to prolong, to, to extend our oligonucleotide is to deblock, to remove this blocking group, and then add the second base of our DNA. This has a blocking group here, which is important because that would prevent then these two groups from reacting. So 5' prime to 5', prime, which is not what we want. We want 5' prime to 3'. Prime. The 3' prime end of the molecule has the phosphorus atom here, in the place we, we expect, but then has these bulky groups here uh, attached to the phosphorus so that uh, the chemistry is controlled. Um, we react this molecule with this one and this branched structure here with the nitrogen in the middle re is removed and we now have a DNA, single-stranded DNA with two nucleotides. Um, an important step is to cap these molecules that didn't couple because no, no chemical reaction is 100% efficient we need to take care that these molecules that didn't couple they could in theory go around and couple again with base number three but that's not what we want because we want an exact sequence so we cap we add a, a, an inactivating group here and we make sure that these molecules that didn't participate in the coupling, they don't participate in the next rounds of extension of the DNA. Um, the next step is to oxidize the phosphorus in the middle here. And we get the structure that we are used to. And we are ready to extend another cycle or decouple or cut this link here and purify the DNA. We also have to remove this structure here, of course. Um, this technology is getting less and less expensive every, every year, so it makes less and less um, sense economically to actually go and clone genes um, from, from the original organism. It might be less expensive to look up the sequence that you need in the database and then simply design your gene from, for the, the objective you want.